Uh, I'm Danny, I'm from Glock Factory, as he has mentioned. Uh, if you guys are wondering why I'm wearing this, uh, it's actually a name tag. Uh, it's my Glock Factory ID, but it would be a lot more helpful if everyone started wearing name tags. Because personally, myself, uh, I'm really bad with names. Uh, the two guys I just met earlier, uh, I remember the names, uh, Sunil and Nobby, although I forgot which one is which, but Sunil and Nobby. So, uh, in that scenario, I really need your help. So, uh, if you guys can, in future meetups, uh, please try to have name tags. Uh, not a requirement, but uh, for me. So, just my humble request. Um, and before I start my presentation, uh, I have to uh, make some statements. Uh, I was not forced into doing this. Um, it is of my own free will. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because I may or may not have spread some rumors in the office that I'm being forced into this. So I'm definitely not being forced into this. Um, so let's get started. So what am I going to be talking about today? I'm going to be talking about quality assurance, right? You guys all know what quality assurance is. So this is our table of contents. We're going to be uh, first looking at what is quality assurance, some testing principles, and blah, blah, blah. We'll get there when we get there. So first, oh, first, what is quality assurance? Can anyone tell me? Quality assurance. In simple terms. Yes. Uh, quality assurance, which is good, I mean, software and all, no? Maybe which is good, is that we got the money. But previously, say, go to the sector, so you got the number. Can't say quality assurance. So, uh, in one word, uh, how would you describe uh, quality assurance? <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyone else? Yes. Semantics. Semantics. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to give it a shot? You guys have to be more interactive. You guys haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> so, anyone else? Okay, basically in Nepal, there's a misconception, or I think there's a misconception. Um, people associate quality assurance with testing. So I know most of you guys probably have uh, colleagues in the workplace and they have the role QA engineer, right? So quality assurance engineer. So you guys associate that with just testing, right? Whatever we develop, we give to them, they will test. But quality assurance is actually more, more than that. So, oh, sure. Yeah, I think I'm speaking too fast, sorry. Um, I read this off a dictionary somewhere, I forgot, so it's, uh, you can read what quality assurance is. But the main point here is quality assurance is not just testing, it is also about the process that goes into the development, right? So, most people in uh, Nepal think a QA engineer only focuses on testing, but that is only part of it. The QA engineer is also responsible for the process. So, how do you, what is your development life cycle, right? Like, so, and in Cloud Factory, we like to say, quality assurance is a process, not a role. So everyone should be taking ownership. It is not just you have the role QA engineer, it is your responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. And today we're going to be talking about a bit more on how as front-end developers, I know some of you are full stack, uh, we can help our QAs in quality assurance. So this is a simple pyramid. Most of you will have a different pyramid, right? Of how testing in your company may look like. But the most important thing is right at the bottom. No matter what pyramid you look at, at the base, you will always see unit testing. And there's a reason why unit testing is at the bottom. The reason is you always need to have the most amount of unit tests. And then it works the way out, right? So alpha testing and beta testing, you're going to have the least amount. Because as you go up the pyramid, it gets more expensive. So as front-end developers, we are primarily focused on four things. Uh, first of all, unit testing. Uh, do you guys know what is unit testing? Does anyone want to give a shot at defining unit testing? Nobody. Don't be afraid of being wrong. Even I myself may not know what is unit testing. Who knows, right? Anyone? No one wants to try. Unit testing is basically 
as the name implies, a unit, right? So when you say unit testing, you look at the smallest form. So what is the smallest form your code can take? Usually that is a function, right? It could be an object, it could be a class. So you find the smallest form and you test it in isolation. So you ensure that it does not interact with any other parts of your system. Next is integration testing. So after unit testing, if you need to test two units and how they work together, then that falls under integration testing. Next is visual regression testing. Does anyone know what this means? Visual regression testing. Uh, basically it means you are looking at the UI. So visibly, when you make changes, how, like when, whenever we test, right, usually we test our code. But how do we know that the CSS is not broken? The button may be there, right? But how do we tell that the button is at an exact location? It is on the top right hand or top left hand. We usually don't do that kind of stuff, right? So visual regression testing takes care of that. So there's a lot of tools out there that will help you with this. One of them is great. Um, and the last one, of course, is performance testing, right? Do you guys do performance testing? I think everyone does performance testing, but may not be automated, right? I think that's the thing. And uh, Chrome development tools, it has the audit function, uh, which used to be Lighthouse, but it got integrated into Chrome. So you can use that function for performance testing. So at Cloud Factory, we, oh, we focus on unit testing and integration testing. So that's what we have automated right now. We are working on automating the other two things as well, but that's in the future. So today I'll be focusing on unit testing as well as integration testing. So you have methodologies, right, when you are testing. Do you guys know, have you guys heard of PDD, BDD, ADDD, some ADD, I don't know. Have you guys heard of these methodologies? Anyone? Come on, interactive guys, don't be afraid. It, DDD is test-driven development. Yes, DDD is test-driven development, right? So does anyone know what it means? All my, what is test-driven development? No, no, that, that's a good answer, that's a good answer. Uh, don't be afraid to be wrong. Uh, the reason we are here is because we don't know everything, right? So we are trying to learn. So that, that's a really good answer and that's actually a correct answer. So test-driven development basically means uh, testing is integrated into your development. So it's going to look something like this. So you write your specs first or your test cases first, then you write your code, uh, you make sure your test cases fail. Obviously, if you write your test cases, then you run them and they pass. You have to fix your test cases, right? You have to make sure that all of them fail. Next, you write your code, and then you make sure your code passes the test. And then you repeat. You refactor either your specs, your code, you repeat until you're satisfied with the optimization that you have made, right? So uh, that's DDD. What about BDD and ADDD and some other terms that people like to throw about? So BDD is a, a newer form of DDD. They're essentially the same thing. So if we go on to the next slide. So BDD is behavior driven development. So they are basically, and uh, ADDD is acceptance test driven development. So they are basically improvements made DDD. So DDD itself is really basic. You just write specs, make sure they pass, and that's how you do your development, right? But for behavior-driven development and ADDD, it's a little bit different. So, actually it took me a long time to figure out what are the differences between these three. Because if you go online and you Google, you can try right now. If you put in DDD versus BDD versus ADDD, there will be 10 websites and all 10 websites will have 10 different answers. So, the thing is, it's not consistent. So, in my definition, the way I look at it, TDD is low level, right? So I have an example there. Can you guys read the text? I'll read it for you guys. So for a simple Facebook uh, ad friend feature, or remove friend, if you guys like that, um, 
you have a simple statement, assert button, add friend calls function, add friend. So clicking the button, that's title add friend, will call the function add friend. So that's a really simple test, right? That's DDD. Does it tell you anything about its behavior? Not so much, right? Maybe as a technical person you understand. But what about non-technical people? What happens if you bring in your product managers and you have them take a look at this code? They won't understand, right? So that's where BDD and ADDD come in. So if you look at BDD, we say, given friend request feature is available, when the add friend button is clicked, expect friend request to be sent. Now is it a lot more clearer? And if you give this statement to anyone on the planet, uh, unless they don't know how to read, they will understand, right? So that's, that's the difference between BDD and BDD. Most people like to say, BDD is just BDD done right. And ADDD is more high level. It's something that your product manager might give you. Your product manager might say, user will send friend requests when the button is clicked. So that's a high level requirement. At the low level, you have calling the function. And in the middle, where everything is together, it's where uh, it's very clear, right? BDD. So let's move on. Oh, any confusions? I'm, I'm pretty sure <laughs> there might be some confusions. OK, let's move on. So now you look at DDD, BDD, ADDD. I don't know what else people come up with. Uh, the one I just saw recently on Twitter, uh, it's called ADD. So what methodology should we use? And is it important to adopt a methodology? In my opinion, you have to do what works best for you and your company. Don't get too caught up in the definitions. Like, I made the mistake of being caught up in the definition. What's the difference? Which one is better? Uh, which one should I choose? Instead of doing that, you should uh, look at what does your company do? How do I make my spec readable? How do I ensure that my spec becomes a form of documentation? Because when you're working with hundreds of features, and let's say uh, my our Roman Day has worked on a different part of the app that I can never touch. And suddenly Roman Day is on me. So now I have to step into his shoes, right? So how do I know what features are available? First thing I do, I look at the specs. And looking at the specs, I know what is the expected behavior and what should I do to fix the issue that we're having. So that's, that's why it's so important. And actually, ADD stands for Annoyance Driven Development. So when you get annoyed, you change stuff. And you keep changing until you stop being annoyed. So that's something you can adopt as well. That's something I believe we do at Power Factory. We don't like it, we change it. Until we are happy, we keep changing. So it's iterations. So I wanted to list out some of the technologies that we are using at Power Factory. And you guys might be familiar with some of them. So I'm pretty sure even uh, my own friends at Top Factory will not recognize some of the images here. Uh, yeah, I intentionally used the oldest image I could find. For example, the ghost there is Phantom JS, but Phantom JS actually does not use that logo anymore. It's discontinued. So I will go uh, more in depth into some of the technologies that we use. So. We're going to be looking at our React app. So in our React app, the most basic uh, that you need is a spec runner. You need something to run your specs. So we use Mockup for our spec runner. And the next thing you need is an assertion library. So remember earlier we talked about PDD, PDD, ADD. They all have their own syntax, right? How to write specs. They have their own syntax. So in order for you to, if you choose, let's say, PDD, now you need an assertion library that can handle expect, that can handle shoot. So that's why we have chosen Chai. So Mocha and Chai. Mocha is the spec runner. Chai is our assertion library. The next thing we have is Enzyme. Specifically because we are using React, we need, to, we need some sort of fixture. We need to render our components, right? Uh, when, when you run your uh, code in the browser, it's the browser engine that does the rendering for you, right? But when you are writing specs, what does the rendering? 
So you have to use frameworks, right? So Enzyme is one of the frameworks that allow you to traverse and manipulate React components. The next thing I have is Synon. So has anyone here used Synon? Yes. Nice. Uh, do you guys want to explain what Synon is? <laughs> they are pointing to each other. I like it. Uh, mostly we used it to stop uh, more features that uh, let's say mocking the library. And the best implementation I remember was so we needed to like uh, set time out between courses and we could actually uh, increment the time using time that we could create a fake lock and we could actually uh, speed the time to 5 seconds and 10 seconds, 50 seconds. So we needed to test how we could react in uh, what the state should be in 5 seconds, what the state should be in 10 seconds. So we could actually fast forward the time using speed. Great example, thank you. Uh, so basically, earlier we talked about unit testing, right? And we say we have to test that unit in isolation. So how do we do that? For example, if I have a function within a function, how do I ensure that the function inside my function doesn't run? Because if the function inside my function runs, is that unit testing? It's not, right? Now you have two units, right? So how do I ensure that it doesn't run? What do I do is I stop it, right? So stop it means I stop the function from running. The stop will tell me that the function has ran, but the function will not run. So that's basically why we use Synon. A proxy file is a little bit like Synon, but it does something that Synon cannot do. So we talked about stopping functions, right? What about your stopping your imports, whatever you require? Let's say you've required something like blue box or um, some UI, let's say you have uh, a form or a message, a messaging system. So you don't have that code in your code base itself. But whenever you run a function, that will run as well because it's imported, right? So how do you stop your imports? So proxy wire gives us a way to stop our imports. Is anyone confused? Okay. Uh, at any time, feel free to stop me. Uh, you can raise your hand and uh, ask a question. Anytime, it's open. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, earlier whatever technologies I presented to you guys, we used that uh, predominantly for unit testing. So now we go into integration testing. So in integration testing, we actually use Nightwatch. Uh, if you guys have not used Nightwatch yet, uh, check it out. It's really easy to use. You will probably learn how to use it in a few hours. It's Selenium based, and what it does is, you know how your poor QAs uh, always have to do the same thing every time you make a change? For example, if you have to check the submit button, I make one change, the QA has to fill out the form, submit. Make another change, fill out the form, submit. Is there a way to automate it? So Nightwatch allows you to automate that process. So if you need the user to click some buttons, if you need the user to put in some input, Nightwatch can do that for you. So now uh, we've gotten to the point where we have written specs, right? So how do we measure how well we've written our specs? Let's say me and Ramon there. Two of us write specs for a particular block of code. They're going to be very different. Dai is going to say this is better, I'm going to say mine is better. So how do we know whose is better? Does anyone know? How do we know? Actually, the answer is quite long. Uh, we decide. We discuss and decide. But, 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 there are a few metrics that we can look at. So, there's two things. Uh, at Clock Factory, we uh, have actually started a uh, spec writing standard. Cover any lines, then it goes wrong. For example, if you have an if else statement, if while testing, you only go through the if statement, then your else statement will be in red. It will say you have not tested that part. So that's how we do it at Cloud Factory. And one of the tools that we use uh, for spec coverage is actually uh, NYC, which is based on uh, Istanbul JS. And you have lots of uh, spec coverage reports, right? Every time you run the spec coverage, uh, 
every, every time you run the coverage, you will have a report that's generated. So how do we centralize all the reports in one place? How do we look at the difference? So from one commit to the other commit, how do I ensure that my spec has improved? How do I ensure my percentages have gone up? So we actually use a tool that's called CodeGirl. Uh, unfortunately, I thought I had put it in there, but it's not there. Uh, we use something called CodeGirl. It's integrated into GitHub. It's really easy. Uh, you guys can check it out if you guys are interested. So uh, in the future, right now you see this block of technologies that we're using. Mocha, Chai, Sinon, Enzyme, Proxyquire, Istanbul, right? The thing is, all of these can be done with a single library, and that is Jest, right? So what we are doing is we are trying to migrate from Mocha into Jest. So the advantages of Mocha is that you can pick and choose what library you want to use. So if you want to use a different assertion library, so if tomorrow instead of Chai, something like Tiapot P comes or some, some Nepali development, then you can switch, right? I have that flexibility. I don't like Chai, I take Tiapot uh, I don't like Tiapot P, I take Mocha. So you have that flexibility. That's the strong point of Mocha. But for Jazz, the strong point is you have no setup. So you don't have to go around uh, all these repos, reading all these uh, GitHub comments. Everything is already there. And in the last two years, uh, Facebook has been very committed to improving Jets, right? So uh, if you go onto their website, they actually have a roadmap of what's to come. And yeah, that's about it. Questions and answers. This is not quality and assurance. It's questions and answers. <laughs> Do you guys have uh, questions? Please ask questions. Don't be afraid. Yes, yes. Did you mention uh, being uh, more projects than basically? What I see from your, uh, what I understood from the presentation is more text than the same projects. Do you elaborate from the So, yeah, there were two parts to the presentation. So, uh, a lot of it was testing, right? How we're going to test, what kind of tools we use. But if you remember earlier, we talked about TDD, BDD, ATDD. That's actually the process side. So that's how we're going to write specs, when we're going to write specs. Does that answer your question? So that's more of the process side. Yes. So our friend wants us to repeat the section on Sinon and... <laughs> and Proxyquire. So... Okay. So basically Sinon is stubbing and spikes, right? So what we do is, uh, what happens if you have a function within a function? And you want to do unit testing. How will we do it? We have to make sure that the function inside our function that we are going to test doesn't run, right? So what do we do? We stop that function and we use Sinon to do that. So we ensure that our unit tests are actually real unit tests. They are isolated. Because that function running inside your function can cause issues, right? What if the function you're testing is not failing, but it's one of its dependencies? So that's about Sinon. And Proxyquire is basically the same as Sinon but it goes a step higher. It allows you to modify your imports. So, uh, for example, uh, you import a React component from React, right? If you wanted to change that, you could do that with Proxyquire. So instead of importing a React component class, you can make up your own class. So that's the bit about Synon and Proxyquire. Good question. Anyone else? Yes? Yeah, AD is just a joke, but <laughs> it's a joke with some truth to it. Uh, annoyance driven development does exist, at least in my world. I like to think that I practice it. Good question. Yes. What are the major differences of manual testing and automatic testing? Major differences? Um, the one thing is, like with manual testing, it can get really time consuming. 
and like honestly, it affects your motivation. Like if I'm asked to test the same thing a hundred times a day, like you would feel demotivated, right? And it's also so time consuming. So instead of doing that, why not we automate the process and we make it as quick as possible. So instead of, and you also have to remember all the scenarios. If I were to do it manually, if I have a hundred cases to test, then I have to go through each case, right? And sometimes as a tester, I might miss one or two cases, but with automation, we don't have that problem. It's really fast. You put in one command and all of your cases are tested for you. Hello. Uh, I have like two, two or three questions. So, how much time do you spend writing tests? Who writes the tests? Is it another code review feature? Is it something else? And the third thing is, do you code review tests? How do you make sure the tests are? Great question. So there's a few parts to the question. Uh, I think the first part is who takes the responsibility for writing specs, right? Is it the space? Is it the developers? Or is it the tech lead? Is it the PM? It could be anyone. But uh, uh, at Cloud Factory, what we do is the specs are written by developers, but uh, with QA involvement. So the QAs will know what we're going to test for. Uh, in fact, we sit down with them. We have a discussion. So these are the requirements. So when the story comes in, these are the requirements. These are the edge cases. These are the test scenarios. So whatever they are going to be testing for, I will include them in my specs as far as possible. And I think you had a second part to that question. So the two remaining parts, how much time do you spend writing them? What And do you code review? Yes, we do code review our tests. And sometimes uh, PRs do get stuck just because of uh, specs not being written uh, according to our standards. So that is definitely a yes. Uh, and how much time do we spend writing tests? Uh, it could vary, but in general, uh, equal or greater to. Uh, in fact, I finished my uh, development really fast, and then oh, I have to do specs. So I spend a lot more time uh, doing specs than development. I like development, I hate doing specs, but I have to do it. <laughs> Any other questions? Or we can call it a day. Thank you guys. Thanks for being interactive.